prayer, the wonder of prayer. Uh, today we're dealing with the way of prayer. Pardon? Yes, please. God often reveals great truths. Can you see that? Once the lights are dim, the day of my As a way, uh, as we read scripture, we find that. In fact, I was just reading in the book of Mark, and it starts with John preparing the way for Jesus. Uh, I was reading it, by the way, in Spanish. I was <laughs> a challenge to read my Bible in Spanish, so I started doing that. Camino. So, we have the way of holiness as we speak of the way. Christianity was known as the way. Uh, and I want to speak to you about the way of prayer. First of all, prayer is a pursuit. The word pursuit is an interesting word to me. We quote it often from what passage in Hebrews? Huh? Yes. Uh, follow peace with all men and the sanctification. It's, uh, some translations use the word pursue. Uh, that word pursue is not seeking after something to find it. It's having found it, stay on it. All right? That's what it means. It carries the idea of already being on the way, on the path, and staying on it. In other words, now that you're on it, keep following it to its destination. And that's what prayer is all about. The word. Well, let me illustrate this just real quick. I have a friend. Uh, he's about six foot, uh, not six, five foot. He's five foot eight or nine in there. Uh, works with World Gospel Mission as a missionary, Steve Cartwright. And uh, he's given me permission to give this illustration and uh, talking with him because we've had a lot of communication together over what God has done in his life. And I can't go into the details of it except to say that he's about 5'8", five, 5'9", five, and he was knocking at 400 pounds. 380, and then he'd get up higher, then he'd go on diets. He said, I get down a little, and then I get right back up there. And I can't even go into all the details except that one day someone really challenged him and said, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. I mean, faced him on it, and you're abusing it. And he broke down over that, sought out a doctor, and a nutritionist. They put him with a nutritionist. And that nutritionist told him, Steve, diets don't work. You have to change your lifestyle. And I think that's a problem we face in a lot of our Christian experience, is that we tend to treat it as a diet. Uh, we kind of shoot at it a little bit, do it for a while, and then we're back at the same old thing again. This is true even with sin. One of the problems with, Roger, we were, you were mentioning to me with Calvinism, is just that. I'm going to keep working on it. Have you ever noticed that they're still working on it ten years later? <laughs> because they haven't changed their lifestyle. And if we don't come to a real change of lifestyle, nothing's going to happen to us. If we do, and this is Steve Cartwright with his daughter. Uh, these are the pants that he wore when he weighed that heavy. Now they're both able to stand in one leg, each one. He's down to 156 pounds. And then there. He runs marathons. And he puts it on Facebook if you want to see him on Facebook. The only reason he does it, he said, is not to brag or anything. He said it's to keep accountable. He said, I, I have people watching me. So I tell them where I've been running. He used to be, uh, he used to have high blood pressure, was very diabetic. He taking a lot of medication for those two things, especially, and other things. Now he doesn't take any medication. Because he changed his lifestyle. Now, there's a difference between being overweight and being obese. He was at the point of, of, of obesity. Prayer is also a journey. If you want to learn from someone, sit at their feet. Uh, I love Dave's presentation yesterday. We were sitting at his feet, you know, learning from him. But if you want to uh, know someone, travel with them. <laughs> You're going to really get to know what that person is like. <clears throat> That's why I like to journal my praying. 
Uh, it's a record. It's a reminder of, of our walk together. And it also keeps me accountable in relation to God. It's something I just started doing some years ago, and it's been very, very helpful to me. I had my daughter Ann uh, talk to me uh, one time, one day, and uh, she said, Dad, if you're making a trip to Bolivia, I'd like to go with you. She said, uh, Maria and Emily have been there with you, and I have. And she said, when we were there doing a meeting or something, she said, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to join you in that. Because she said, I want to see where you grew up. I don't feel like I know something about you. I've heard your stories and all, but I want to see where it happened. So I was able to work a meeting out, kind of change the dates a bit, the university that my brother Jimmy works with. And uh, they, they were very kind in moving those dates so that I could have, and I said, if you come, bring Lydia with you, uh, our oldest friend, child. And so, a wonderful, wonderful time. Uh, Jimmy had his vehicle, truck, and so he drove us all over. We went to where I was born, we went to where I was raised, we went to where my father planted a church out in the little village of Ascension. We went up the road that heads towards Tango where I went to boarding school. And, and, and I remember one moment where we were all in the pickup with Sarah, and Lydia, Jimmy, talking about all the different things that had happened in our lives. And, and uh, you know, I said, it reminds me of a hymn. All the way, my Savior leads me. What have I to ask besides? And there were moments of laughter. There were moments of crying uh, while we were trying to share all of these things. And then she did this for me. I have no idea. Put together a journal of our travels together. All the way, using that song. All the way, my Savior leads me. And this is what she says, just some of it. Places for us. Shape us into the person we become. For you, this place is Bolivia. I have come to realize that to fully know you means knowing the place that is your birth home. After traveling the Bolivian countryside with you this year, I feel like I know and understand you more fully. I saw with my own eyes the land that shaped you, and not just the land, but the memories that arise from it. The situations and circumstances that God used to form you into the Father I know. I feel like I am able to grasp more completely the way our Savior truly led you all the way through adventure and illness, family togetherness and separation, city and village, rivers and jungle. All the way God used the land in which he placed you to draw you to himself. Because of the way God used Bolivia to shape you, it has in effect shaped me and all of the people of your family. And for this, I am grateful all the way your Savior has led you, shared each winding path you tread. That's what God wants for us, is to travel with Him. You're going to get to know Him on this journey. Right? The famous psychiatrist, Dr. Scott Peck, who wrote People in the Lie, also wrote The Road Less Travel. Titles speak for themselves, and both books are disquieting. But let me just declare, neither has any place in the matter of prayer, as far as the titles are concerned. It just doesn't have any place in the matter of prayer. The books are good books, by the way. I'm just referring to the titles. If real praying is anything, it is heart-searchingly honest. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me, know my thoughts. And if praying is real, it must be the road most traveled. So where are you? And there's no doubt in my mind that this is the question we each have to answer before God on the whole matter of prayer. Where are you? 
Are you on the journey? Are you with him in this? Are you traveling with him? When it comes to prayer, it's much like what our children used to ask when on a long distance journey. You know the question? <laughs> Are we there yet? <laughs> What's the answer? No, we're not there yet. They can ask it a hundred times, you know. We're not there yet. And the next question is, how much further? How much longer? The answer to that is forever. Yes, forever. In other words, as a Christian, we had better know the practice of prayer now because this is what we'll be doing throughout eternity. Prayer isn't just something that God gave to us here. Prayer is our life. And it's our eternal life. It's communion with God. It doesn't begin and stop here. It continues. And so the practice of prayer is vital for continuation if I am to know him as I should. <clears throat> you can't love God and others without prayer. And eternity will be full of love. <clears throat> you can't work fellowship with God without prayer. And eternity will be full of fellowship. It has to do with communion. You can't worship God without prayer. And eternity will be full of worship. You can't praise God without prayer. And eternity will be full of praise. You can't learn from God without prayer. And by the way, learning will not stop here. Learning will really begin. <laughs> We're going to see things like we have never dreamed in our, in our life. And he's infinite. And we will learn and learn and learn and learn more and more about him. You can't do that without prayer. Without communion with God. You can't walk with God without prayer. And eternity will be full of walking. When the Apostle Paul said, pray without ceasing, he meant it's what Christians ought to do now and eternally. And I love an Old Testament thought concerning the bird offering where God told Moses to keep the fire burning continually. It must not go out. <laughs> oh, to have that fire in our hearts. This is what I do all the time. This is a pursuit of mine. I'm on, the, I'm on it. I'm on that road and I keep on it. I stay on it. It becomes a journey. I remember praying with Ellen Kerman one time. There were a bunch of us young people, actually not just young people, people from the church that Max was pastoring, Max Morgan, when we attended church there at Wesley Chapel in Anderson, Indiana. And Eldon was there at that time, which was the reason I was there as a young man. That's where I met Sarah. Uh, Eldon was teaching at the seminary at that time, trying to put together a program to bring in kids to teach them Wesleyanism. And so I came in, he had invited me, became a part of that. One of the reasons <coughs> I came is because they were going to pay my way. It was free. <laughs> That's a good reason to get into that kind of graduate program. But anyway, he was an interesting prayer. He would get flat out on the floor, uh, just lay with his face down to the floor. And uh, he'd just pray at the top of his voice and crying out to God. <coughs> and I remember particularly one day he had prayed and, and he knew others needed to pray as well. And, and so he came to the end and he said, now Father, he said, I, I'm not done yet. He said, I'm just going to put a comma on this. Not a period. He said, I'm coming back. <laughs> I thought, how beautiful, you know, that our prayers ought to be commas, not periods. We're, we're coming right back. We're going to keep praying. 
for a few moments, if you will, walk the path with me today, and together let's learn some important things to watch for. First of all, prayer in the way. There's a great Bible story for this. It's the story of Abraham's servant going to find a wife for Isaac. And when God answered his prayer with Rebecca, Genesis 24, the servant said in verse 27, and I really like the way the King James Version puts it, and he said, Blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who hath not left destitute my master of his mercy and his truth, I being in the way the Lord led me. <laughs> The New American Standard Bible says the Lord has guided me in the way. Again, it carries the idea of pursue as we have defined it. In other words, the only way in which we will end up with the will of God is to be in the way with God all the time. Where I'm not having to all of a sudden panic and say, Oh God! It's sort of like the old lady that Francis... Uh, Francis, uh, let's see, uh, no, I uh, want to say his name, I can't say it right Schaefer? now. No, no, not Schaefer. The old time Baptist preacher. What was his name? Haver. Haver. Anyway, he said uh, this old lady was in the hospital and the doctors had done about all they could do and they said, I guess it's just time you're going to have to trust the Lord. And she said, oh. Has it come to that? <laughs> <laughs> That's about where a lot of people... Vance Havner. That's about... I love that guy, by the way. If you ever can get a hold of his books, uh, great, great writer. Uh, simple writer. But we, we tend to enter into prayer when things are in a panic mood. Oh, has it come to that, finally? It shouldn't just have, has it come to that? It should be that we're always involved in this. And so we don't come as strangers to God. Uh, we've been with Him. And I, I, can, I can speak easily and quickly and know that He's not afar off. He's very close, very real to me in that sense. So, prayer <laughs> cannot be a secondary act. It must be primary. This is the way of prayer. The God of prayer has the right to call anything else to a halt. He has the right to call anything else to a fast. Anything else to a fast. And he has the right to call me to full attention. Prayer is our daily confession of who is Lord. I'm coming in just every, every day through the moments of the day, I am confessing to him, there is no other God beside you. You're the only one I come to. I don't create other gods in order to try to fix things in my life. And it's a constant confession, but it's also our daily covenant to the Lord. And that is, as we enter into the vows with our wife or husband, if you're married, where it was not just that moment where in, in the sentimental moment where we, say, we look in each other's eyes and don't have a clue what's going on, we go on with this. We know that here's where life <coughs> together really begins. And we can't just count on this moment. We've got to count on every moment. And we grow in this moment. And we covenant together day after day. <coughs> through our actions and through our attitudes with one another, that I am all for you, and I know that you're all for me. It has to do with our daily communion with the Lord. Again, I won't dwell on this, except again to just make the point. This is where we talk with God. And this is where He talks with us. Prayer is our daily compass. It's the Lord dealt with this, I think, where some of you heard Sarah and I have taken this phrase as sort of our motto in life, and that is where Peter, after the resurrection, had <laughs> called six other disciples, and, and they went fishing. You remember the story, and they caught nothing, and Jesus calls from the shore and says, basically, the idea is, and not so much a question as a statement, you haven't caught anything, have you? Horrible thing to say to a fisherman that's fished all night. And no, they said we haven't, and 
uh, been fishing here all night. He said, cast on the right side of the boat, and, and uh, they did, and they could hardly pull them in. And at that point, John turns to Simon Peter, <laughs> and I, I think there ought to be an exclamation point at the end of that, because it must have been something to him. He just turns to Peter and says, it's the Lord. <laughs> and Peter jumps in the water and swims to shore. And I have taken this as my model, Sarah and I have, that we don't want anything to happen in our lives or do anything in our lives, but that we can say it's the Lord. It's the Lord. And so that becomes our daily compass. Is this his lead? Is he the one speaking to us in this? If I don't have that compass, I will get myself into a heap of trouble quickly. Then there's prayer on the way. The word way can speak as we have of a path, but it can also speak of a nature of something. The nature of something, as in that's its way. When it comes to the matter of prayer, what we must know is that our way must harmonize with his way. And so it's our very nature. That way within us is who we are. That's the way we act. That's the way we respond. That's the way we move. What have I done? <laughs> Now I'm going to go to a very sinful analogy. Praying is like a dance. <laughs> At least it used to be. And we're all Wesleyans in one sense or another here, and they don't dance. In a positive sense, it takes two to tango. Now, I don't dance. I, I, Sarah's wanted to take me to dancing lessons. I, I ain't got it in me. <laughs> but I like to watch a good dance. I like good old country western dancing. It's alive, you know. I like ballroom dancing. It, it, to me, it's just incredible to watch. These people move together. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, the old piece? Maybe. <laughs> But what you find, it's full of delight. I, people who really like to dance, and I'm not talking sensual dancing here, I'm talking about just enjoying the dance with your partner, you know? There's tremendous delight in it. You, you can just see the delight in it all. It's the Book of Solomon on the soul. That's what prayer is. And, and we're moving together. It's full of intensity. Jesus calls this the fervent prayer of a righteous man. And, you know, they're, they're not Elroy Manst. <laughs> Sorry, Elroy. <laughs> See here. <laughs> they, were, they were talking about you earlier. You should have been here, Elroy. Thank you, so <laughs> But anyway, on the other hand, you ought to see Elroy move. <laughs> when he gets moving, he really moves. He moves with intensity, especially with the eye coaching the bottom of his glass or pop bottle. Remember that, Elroy? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sucking the life out of it. He had the straw right on top of it. <laughs> that was down in Paraguay. He got very intense at that point. He got very sick. <laughs> Not because it did anything to him, but because he couldn't stand the clock. <coughs> it's full of harmony. The harmony is not a matter of governing where God is in control of me and he's going to make me move certain ways. No, it, it, he's a lead dancer, but only to give direction. If, if God is a matter of governing my life, then all I'm doing is just doing what he's telling me to do all the time. No, I've begun to learn to move with him. And he's a tremendous lead dancer. You've got to have a lead dancer. But only to give direction. The key is submission. Without the death of self. You're not killing the spirit. You're realigning it. 
what I mean is, this is a partnership, a two-way communication. To have good communication, we should want to know how the other thinks. How does the other feel? How does the other act? How does the other move? How do they respond? <coughs> now this takes place when we have a knowledge of the Word of God. So we need to learn to pray the Word. And I'm going to keep emphasizing this. But it's really important to pray the Word. David uh, spoke of the fact that the book of Mark, they didn't have the book of Mark. They had it read to them. And then what happened, especially in the Old Testament sense, is much of what they knew was memorization. I'm very poor at memorization. I wish I was better at it. But they had the Word of God in their minds. And they could go to the Psalms. Because most of these Jewish boys and girls, they grew up memorizing it all. And so they could quote it. And, and pray that way. <laughs> this takes place when we have a knowledge of the way of God. Think like God. And this was, this was what Jesus was saying to Simon Peter. And I, I, I'll let Dave really deal with this because I know you probably will uh, in relation to chapter 8 of Mark. Uh, and that is, you don't have the mind of God. You don't think like God thinks. We need to learn to think like God thinks. We need to surrender ourselves to Him to say, I want your mind in my life. Lead me in my prayer so I become sensitive to the way God is moving. This takes place when we have a knowledge of the will of God. Seek like Jesus saw. Again, that famous prayer of His. Father, if this cup can be taken from me, take it from me. Not my will. I have contended, and I said this to our missionaries when I was with World Gospel Mission, and that is I don't want you to go to the field because of souls. Oh yes, go because of souls. But don't go because of souls. I, I would contend that Jesus himself, and I, I'm very careful here because he came for us, he died for us. We know that. But in a greater way, he went to the cross not for me. He went to the cross because of his father. He was totally given to him. He said, if this cup can be taken from me, take it from me. Not my will be done. Your will be done. That's a greater motivation. And I told our missionaries, if you go for souls, I guarantee you, you'll be back soon. They'll kill you. But if you go for the Father, and you say, I'm here to do your will, no matter how difficult it becomes, you'll stay. You're dancing with Him. You're in harmony with Him. It's full of direction. Now, let me just make this statement here because I, I think the tendency is we, as we teach and want to make a point about something the point becomes so big in our minds that we think oh man I, I don't know if I can do that and then some try and they enter into what I call a super ball experience it's a super ball Christian uh, super spiritual and super spiritual people make me nervous <laughs> <laughs> and we can do this with prayer to where it's not a delight it's just a horrific bird that's all it is uh, a duty gotta do this kind of thing that's not the intention of prayer never has been well there are disciplines involved and we'll note some of those later but this is out of our delight for God we love him. And Jesus said, I only do what the Father tells me to do. I only go where the Father tells me to go. I only say what the Father tells me to say. And that way no man could manipulate him into anything else. He said, I am in harmony with my Father. That's what I do. The problem with super spiritual people 
is they have a lot of energy, it looks good, but no direction. It's what Dr. Richard Taylor said about so many Christians. He said, I found that all too many Christians is that all they do is ricochet through life. They just bounce off of this, bounce off of this and that. And the bounce will finally stop. Just can't keep it going. God is more. He has design. He is a God of precision. Leviticus shows us that. And it's interesting to read even the prophets. It says, I'm in such and such a year, on such and such a month, and such and such a day. And you think, why so precise? Because God is a God of precision. His universe, his world runs precisely on such and such a year, such and such a month, such and such a day. And without discipline, we end up treating God like a roommate rather than the owner of the house. It would do some of us good to write our prayers and begin to shore it up. That's what the Psalms are. Many great prayer, prayers that we admire today were written down. I read a lot of John Wesley's prayers. <clears throat> no one matters, and some of us need to learn to do some heavy lifting here. We've gotten flabby. Prayer for the way. As much as you need certain things for a journey, there are vital things for your prayer journey. Let me mention three of them. There would be more, but I want to stress these. First of all, a clear conscience. He who covers his sin, Proverbs says, will not prosper. But whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. We live in a day of easy sin, and it can't be that way with us. It just can't be that way with us. Even to a marriage relationship, Peter speaks to husbands to live with your wife with understanding. Why? Lest your prayers be hindered. A clear conscience. I come before God and if there's something between me and my wife or you and your husband, go and make that right. If there's something between you and a brother or a sister, go and make that right. And then pray. But pray as you're doing it. <laughs> but it'll help them to open up prayer. <coughs> the Word of God. Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Again, I said I'm going to make a point of this. <laughs> know the Word of God. Get into the Word of God. Use it as a prayer format, if you will, just to pray what you're reading in your life. And then, thirdly, travel lightly. 